I appreciate the opportunity to join you this evening and thank the NAACP. I've been attending your debates for many years now, and I think it's a good public service because it gives the public an opportunity to see who the candidates are. Uh, and thank those of you who have been here since 7 o'clock. It's been a long time. Um, I'm Patricia Healy. I live at Dunroven Lane, named my, my neighbor, who retired on that road, and I've been there since 1985. I've been on the school board since 1999. Well, that's when I was elected, so since 2000. So for, for over half my lifetime in Stafford, I've served on the school board. And it, it has been a privilege. It, it is amazing, and it's very challenging to be on the school board, but it, it is a privilege because we work with our schools, we work with our teachers, and we can help the students. Before I started on the school board, I was with the Stafford County Board of Zoning Appeals, where I served for about 10 years as a, a volunteer uh, resident. And before I moved to Stafford County, I worked for the U.S. Department of Education and the Office for Civil Rights. And I was the executive assistant to the assistant secretary. I worked for three different assistant secretaries who were all political presidential appointees, including Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Thanks. Um, at this time, I am privileged to ask for the Rock Hill voters to let me return for four more years to be their representative on the school board. I work hard. I'm in the schools a lot. I am available day, night, and weekends for my students, parents, community members, and teachers. And I would continue to offer to be accessible and available to work for their interests. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you to the NAACP for sponsoring this forum. My name is Dr. Dean Federoff, and I'm a candidate for the school board for Rock Hill District. Why am I qualified to get your vote? I have a PhD in chemistry. I know the value of a good education. It has allowed me 33 years of, of consecutive employment. I've lived in Stafford County for 22 years. I've seen the population double. I can work with anyone. I've led national and international symposia and scientific and technical working groups. I have two Mountain View High School graduates who've continued their education. I served on the Finance and Budget Advisory Committee for four years, having been elected by its members as their chair. I was appointed by my, my esteemed uh, Rock Hill School Board member. In 2009, our report warned the school board of issues with financial systems and practices, and even opined that there would be a mass exodus of teachers from Stafford County if we didn't make things better. In 2007, I served on the Capital Improvement Committee. That's the committee that decides where and when new schools get built <coughs> and open on time. I served on the 2009 uh, Middle School Redistricting Committee. The most recent incident, the most recent uh, grievance taught us that the quality of a child's education shouldn't depend upon the neighborhood they they live in or be left up to chance. Finally, I served on the, the superintendent's budget and human resources task force, where I learned that salaries make up 85% of the school budget. I will watch every penny. Thank you. Okay, the first question tonight deals with violence in our schools, violence in our community. Uh, it's going to be a piece of what happened at Brook Point. How can that be prevented in the future? Or, you know, it was prevented from, from unfolding. Um, so are our policies adequate in that thing? But the addition that came into our website uh, after we began tonight was, we've also had an uptick of violence in our community, malicious mischief and <coughs> violence. And what can the schools do to help reverse that recent trend? So violence in the schools and violence from juveniles in the community. What is the school's role? Is it adequately being served? What can be done better? Mr. Federoff, you're first. That's a great question. If you go back and look at the pre my presentation before the school board last Tuesday, I ended 
with comments that I'm glad to see we've improved security in our schools. But I also said, considering what's recently happened in Spotsylvania County, that we needed to stop and take a look and reflect whether or not we have the right policies and procedures and practices in place. Violence and bullying are increasing in our school. You all saw the, the video of, of the <coughs> South Carolina deputy grabbing a student and ripping her out of the chair and dragging her out of the classroom over a cell phone. We need to do a better job of education when it comes to violence and when it comes to uh, issues of bullying. We can do a better job. Um, in addition, I, 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 I've got to say that while I said we needed to reflect on those practices, it certainly appears to me that they really did work. Because the school administration responded properly. The sheriff's department, which we have a great one, responded properly. The school administration responded properly. And I'm sure the school board will act responsibly as well. I think the system worked. And that's a good thing. Thank you for your support. I believe that the key to addressing violence in the schools, in the community, is through the partnership that we have in Stafford County Public Schools with the Sheriff's Department. This partnership has been increasing over the years. We have school resource officers in our schools. They're not there to intimidate the children. They're there to be a resource for the children so that the students know that they have someone they can go to if there is an issue, that there is someone they can talk to and they can feel safe. We have taken a lot of steps. We spent a lot of money, both local and grant money, to make sure that we have security for our, our schools. But the example of what happened at Brook Point today, I think, is an excellent example of how our community came together with the schools, with the sheriff's department, to address a potential devastating situation. And there is a public, um, uh, what do you call it, a public address or release, uh, press release, that the sheriff's office put out on that that will give you some more details. But the bottom line is the system worked. There was a potential threat. It came to the attention of the administration. The administration worked with the sheriff's department. They worked with Dr. Benson. And the threat has been addressed. The, the, okay, I have a stop sign, but if you read the press release, and it'll tell you that there has been an arrest. Thank you. Thank you. Our second question deals with testing. And this is a retread from a previous forum tonight. So if you were here, you may have heard the answers. Um, do we do too much testing? Too little? Just the right amount? And how does that affect instructional time? Do we have enough instructional time in the classroom? But what I want to know is I want yes, no. Do we do too much testing? And then I want the balance of the answer is how do you fix it? Uh, I think every candidate forum I've been at for the, for the last number of years talks about problems, but on this one, too much, too little testing, too much, too little instructional time, and how do you make the change, with the emphasis on how will you make a change if one is necessary. So first, to <coughs> this is Ms. Well, the simple answer is yes, there's too much testing. I don't know anyone who would say there's not enough testing or it's just right testing. I mean, talk to any parent, talk to any teacher. Talk to the administrators. Unfortunately, a lot of this testing is out of our control. However, there is effort now on the state level. The governor came to a round table. I see one of our parents in the audience tonight who participated in the, that round table where our parents told the governor, too much testing. You know what the governor said? I agree. I agree and I'm trying, I'm working on that. And they're already cutting some of these tests out. Now, that's the, the state level. There is testing, and some of the candidates earlier this evening mentioned the testing at the local level. And at this point, there may very well be too much testing at that level. And the superintendent, working with the administrators and the teachers, is addressing that. This has to be reviewed. Unfortunately, 
the students come to us at all different ranges. You know, we may have someone enter school who is reading five grades above their level. We may have someone come to high school who has not read at all. There's got to be a way to assess what the needs of the students are so we can make sure we address their needs and then go forth on making sure that they get the education that they need. But bottom line is, too much testing. I thought that when I was kindergarten mom many, many years ago, and that thought hasn't changed. Well, of course the answer is yes. There's, there's far too much testing. And the general, it's incredible in Virginia that it takes an act of the General Assembly to reduce the number of SOL tests that our students take. We reduce, we still have too many SOL tests in grades uh, three through eight. I, th I still think it, they're, they're 17. But the, the governor does has a, have an initiative, and I would put it on the school board's legislative agenda to work with them to reduce the number of tests. But it's just not state and local tests. Last week, the President of the United States directed the Department of Education to look at the number of federally mandated tests and to work with states to help reduce the number of tests to 2% of the school year. Right now, according to the Virginia Education Association, 30% of our classroom time is spent preparing for and taking tests. But it's just not taking tests. Let's look at what those assessments are telling us. All of our schools are accredited, and that's a great thing. But let's look at that in, in perspective. Our, our high school AP tests are, are only 19.6%. Our, our students passing, receiving college credit or being graded college ready on the SATs are only 30%. What, what is all of this testing doing if we're not making good advancement? So our third question you've heard, if you were here before as well, and it deals with the transgender question that came up, I believe, in the Hartwood District. Um, but I didn't really hear an answer, and so I'm going to be more specific. Uh, should we have two bathrooms and transgender students go to one or the other. Should we have three bathrooms, and there's kind of a unisex, transgender, boys and girls, or should we have one? So we all talked about accommodating the students, but I'm asking the tough question, how do you accommodate all the students? And how do you weigh those, those choices? So it goes to the transgender question, and then specifically, what do you do? And I don't want to hear, we're going to wait for the federal government to tell us what to do. I want to hear what you want to do. The issue of gender identity brings forth a lot of emotions and fears and in some cases outright anger. The school board missed a golden opportunity to educate us all on the medical, the legal, the psychological and sociological implications of the transgender issue. Instead, they listened to fear, ran off into a back room and came out and made a decision. Where's the transparency? The United States Department of Justice and the Department of Education have opined that gender identity belongs in a protected anti-discrimination class, just like race and sex and marital status. Stafford County Public Schools has an anti-discrimination policy. Just last, just this week, the Department of Justice Entered, into, entered a uh, friend of the court brief in a federal appeals court supporting gender identity restroom choices. It's not up to the local government how to deal with it. There's already federal law that mandates that we not discriminate. If you support discrimination of one class of people or one group of citizens, then what's to stop you from discriminating against somebody else? Discrimination has no place in Stafford County Public Schools. Mr. Herr, I don't have a simple answer because this is not a simple question. It may appear simple. There are many legal issues that are involved with this question. If it were the law, if it were that clear, we 
you would not have lawsuits against school districts. We would not be in appeals court. We would not be having opinions come out. We would have the law. And I do not believe that I could support something without input from the community. I think it's very important. Now, education is important. And I do not believe in discrimination of any kind. But to my knowledge, transgender is not included among the protected classes under the law with respect to the restrooms that we are talking about. So I am not going to say one, two, or three. And, and I, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I think, I think it's an issue that needs more information. It needs to be addressed. And there are facts. 20 seconds left to address this question. Um, there, there is litigation. There are other school districts involved in litigation right now. Litigation is very expensive for the school district. And I would hope that we will be able to resolve the issues within our community and with our schools without having to engage in litigation that would take money away from the classrooms. Thank you. Okay, our fourth question is from the audience. It deals with proffers. Uh, we've heard proffers mentioned with schools, building schools, um, new facilities, taking up shortfalls. Uh, what is the school, school board's role in proffers? How would you influence, if, if you had any influence in that process, or negotiate to have that kind of source of funds and resources applied to the schools, uh, perhaps more directly than they have been in the past. So proffers, what's the school board role, and specifically what would you do with respect to proffers? And Ms. Healy, you're first. Well, I can give you an answer for that. The school board has no role in proffers. The proffers are voluntary agreements with the local body. It's the board of supervisors who engages in the negotiation who works out the proffers. I see a, a head shaking from one of our, our local, uh, local supervisors here. The school board has no role in that. There is a lot of misinformation that's been passed around about school board negotiating proffers or being involved. A good recent example of that is the, the turf fields. A lot of you know, controversy about the turf fields. The, school, the board of supervisors negotiated proffers specifically to be used for turf fields at Brook Point and in Mountain View. It came to the school board. The school board was the beneficiary of the turf fields. But the school board had no role at all in negotiating and requesting those proffers. So my answer is the school board has no role with respect to the proffers. Thank you. The school board has no direct role in proffers. That's a fact. But if you read every time we have a new development, the school board recommends to the Board of Supervisors that we collect full proffers for schools. That recommendation has been ignored for decades. And what has it hap what is, what's resulted? We have a $30.5 million debt service for decades of poorly planned development and under proffers. That $30.5 million could be going to classes rooms to help reduce class sizes. It could be being used to help fund teacher pay. But instead, you and I, as taxpayers, are paying debt bond, debt service. What can we do? I will work each of the three Board of Supervisors candidates for the Rock Hill District have said that development must pay for itself. And I agree 100%. I will work with my counterpart to recover the impact of development, not cover it up or negotiate it away. Our uh, final question tonight deals with transparency. Uh, we had a previous question about the, uh, the event at Brook Point High School. And a question came in relating to that, that an email went out or a text message or some kind of notification to the parents, but they really didn't know what was going on. 
and they felt that that really wasn't fair to them, that they, they deserved to know what was going on. And I think one of the earlier questions tonight brought in the, the question of transparency and closed and open sessions dealing with decisions on the school board. So do we have sufficient transparency in our school processes for things like notifications to parents and also for the decision process? So transparency, is it sufficient? If it's not, how will you make it more transparent so that people know what's going on to a greater extent? And Mr. Federoff, I believe your first one. Early in my campaign, a number of supporters said to me, you are too analytical. You, have, you look at too many numbers. You need to be a little more okay. personal. And I agree 100%. But I will not apologize for doing my homework and coming to the school board prepared. I will not apologize for being prepared. I'm sorry, what was the rest of the question? It was, it was the transparency of what happened with the... I can give you a lot of examples. I don't think it's funny. I find there are numerous examples of a lack of transparency in Stafford County Public Schools. I gave you some of those examples. With the transgender issue, the school board ran off into closed session. I, I understand that. I appreciate that. Maybe it was for legal advice, but they should still come out and let us know how decisions were made. When we had the redistricting, a committee made recommendations, and the school board ran off into closed session and came back with, with something else and never really did explain how they did that. We need transparency. We need to know how and why decisions are being made. And that's why I'll do my homework. And when I make a decision based upon the facts, you will know why I made that decision. And that's called transparency. Thank you. Uh, just, I'll, I'll take just three of my seconds to say that there were no closed sessions on the redistricting. That's, that's not a correct statement very sensitive subject, so I wanted to make sure everybody understands that. Um, I assume you're talking about the Blackboard Connect. There have been a number of, of systems that have been initiated in Stafford County Public Schools to connect with parents. Uh, there's there's a, a, a program where they can connect directly. They have robocalls. They have text messages. The intent is that the administrators can connect with the parents in the school for a particular school issue or throughout the school system if it involves the entire Stafford County Public Schools. So there is an effort to at all times keep parents informed, most certainly when it involves the security of their children because that, that comes first. And that's something that any teacher, any administrator will tell you is a very top concern. Um, I, I don't know that there has been an issue in that. I know that Dr. Benson issued a statement with respect to it, that there was that statement from Dr. Benson was included in Sheriff Jett's um, press release, and that is available for everyone to know, that we want to keep the community informed. There is an effort to try to keep people involved. Everyone is welcome to come to the school board meetings. We welcome people that come, whether it's to Tell us we've done something good or that they don't like what we're doing. And I've been told to stop, so I'll be available outside if anybody wants to ask me a question. Thank you. So that concludes our questions, and now we have a two-minute closing statement from each candidate. Mr. Federoff, you're first. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that the secret to education was respecting the student. On Tuesday, I had the privilege of being one of the judges at the, at the A.G. Wright Middle School debate. I left there asking myself the question, am I smarter than an eighth grader? One young man during that debate said, and I, and I quote, teachers are the reason for the great minds of tomorrow. What a profound statement. He got that from great teachers. It's time we start retaining them and paying them and respecting them for the hard job that they do. I didn't, we didn't get a chance to talk about priorities, but smaller classes and compensation and recovering the cost of development and learning and testing and program parity are some of my uh, issues that I'd like to have addressed. 
I don't want to lose another thousand teachers or so in the next four years. I'll recognize if we're 40 or 50 teachers short before school starts, not after. I want the new Mont Cure and Ferry Farm Elementary Schools to be built on time with innovative 21st century creative learning environments and not have the design hijacked for those who, who want bigger classes. All three Board of Supervisors candidates said they want development to pay for itself. And I'll work with them to help recover the impact of development. I told you it's robbing $30.5 million from our schools. Last week, the president said he wants the Department of Education to help work with states to reduce standardized testing to 2% of the school year. What a concept, teaching students, not curriculum. Finally, I want to restore the great legacy of Stafford County Public Schools. It's time for a new face, it's time for a new direction, and together let's move Stafford County Public Schools forward. It has been my privilege to serve on the Stafford County School Board. I started when my daughter was seven years old. And I started because I said, if my child is going to go to public school, I'm going to be involved. I thought I'd be done when she was done, and that she's graduated from college now. I'm still here. Obviously, I don't have aspirations to go across the street or to go to higher office. You know, I'm here because I care. I care about the schools. I care about our teachers and our students. I was with uh, my opponent at the debates. This is about the 12th year or more that I've, I've been there. And every year I, I told Mr. Long, the focus teacher, I just continue to be more and more impressed. Mr. Gibbons was there with us as well. And, you know, his opponent, um, Sermon, was there. We had a good representation from the community. But to me, the school board representative has to be part of their schools. I'm in my schools all the time. I mean, I'm there because I want to be there. I want to, to be available. I want my school people to know me and to know that I'm there if they need something. And, and I think they recognize that. So I don't have a child in school anymore, but yet I still care. It's, I'm part of this community, and our schools are an incredible part of the community. When I knock on doors and people say, oh, you know, school board, I don't have kids in school, first thing I say is, but schools matter. They're important. They make a difference. Your schools make your community what it is. And our teachers, our amazing teachers, are why people want to move to Stafford County. Because it's our schools. And can we do better? Of course we can. But I want to tell you, I am proud of our schools. I'm proud of our teachers and what they do with those resources. Ten seconds, classes are too big. Of course they are but yet our teachers are doing more and more that they shouldn't have to do, but they're doing it because they love the kids. And I thank them and I'm proud of them. Thank you. Please give them both a round of applause. I'd also like a round of applause for our timekeeper, Ava Foster.